Uncanny X-Men number 122, titled Cry for the Children, is nobody's favorite X-Men comic. At a time when the series was spinning off legendary stories one after another, it seems like not much happens in this particular issue. And if anything, Cry for the Children seems to exist to bridge the gap between other, more iconic stories. The previous issue wrapped up a Canadian caper for the series, in which they fought the Super Team Alpha Flight for the first time. The next issue of the series will feature the X-Men's first conflict with Arcade, a murder-happy assassin for hire. Arcade does appear in 122, but only as a final page splash, promising a story to come in 123. But that's just one page, so what's on all the others? Well, a lot, I would argue. Uncanny X-Men number 122, in its comparative stillness, offers a great deal in terms of showcasing the manner in which Claremont was using nested, overlapping story structures early in his famous 16-year run on Uncanny X-Men. By breaking this one issue down, and isolating the various narrative arcs that run through it, we might come to see something of Claremont's overall process, and of the long-form storytelling strategies that he's now famous for. Strategies which, I have argued, have played a large part in shaping the current landscape of long-form television, such as we see in contemporary works like Stranger Things or Game of Thrones. The core element of narrative structure is what's called the narrative arc, a line of causality in which related events drive a story through an upward and then downward progression, thus an arc. First devised by Aristotle, the narrative arc is most frequently discussed these days in terms of the three-act structure, which is an elegantly simple three-stage process. One, setup. Two, conflict. Three, resolution. If a story has those three things, it constitutes a narrative arc in itself, and we can use this approach to identify the discrete narrative arcs passing through Uncanny X-Men number 122. Well, we can try. In order to be fair, we have to note that only one narrative arc is entirely contained within this issue, that of Storm's visit to Harlem, which has an identifiable setup, conflict, and resolution, all within Uncanny 122. Set up, Storm visits Harlem to reconnect with her past. Conflict, Storm is attacked by a group of heroin addicts who are squatting in her childhood apartment, thus attacking her sense of nostalgia as well. Resolution, Storm is rescued by Luke Cage, who also educates her on the social reality of what she's just seen. Now, identifying the setup as I have here might be a little generous on my part, since Storm's past, and particularly the negotiation of her selfhood within disparate cultures, has been percolating since her debut in Giant Sized X-Men number one when Professor X asks her to choose between her people, who worship her as a goddess, and the people of the broader world. So the setup to this arc might start a great deal sooner than I've suggested. Isolating resolution is equally tricky, as the continuous world of comics doesn't always offer anything resembling true resolution to the problem at hand. The scholar Umberto Eco accounts for this in his famous essay, The Myth of Superman. Here though, Storm does learn a valuable lesson about inner city life about racial division, and about the sheer complexity of her heritage. But it's not as if those issues are put to bed in the story. Indeed, they will be played out in different arcs across future years of X-Men continuity. My simple point here is that creating this discrete separation between setup, conflict, and resolution is difficult always, but especially difficult in comics particularly, a medium that often avoids resolution altogether. The stories are continuous, maybe even endless. After all, the next issue is always just a month away. With this in mind, we can begin to break down the other narrative arcs contained within Cry for the Children, presuming again that each arc must have an identifiable setup, conflict, and resolution in order to count, I see at least 12 distinct narrative arcs interweaving through Uncanny X-Men 122. The first arc is on the cover and opens the issue. Colossus, a character that we were introduced to as somewhat brash, has lost his confidence as a result of a poor performance in battle with Magneto from Uncanny X-Men number 112 and 113. He's since been expressing self-doubt and second-guessing his value to the team. This story is actually resolved in this issue, right at the start, with Wolverine risking his life to help boost Colossus' confidence. Thus, we have an arc spanning 11 issues coming to a close right at the start of this one. The second arc is a long, simmering conflict between Wolverine and Cyclops. This one is kind of eternal in the X-Men universe, but it actually has a clear beginning in Claremont's run. Wolverine reveals his love for Jean Grey, beginning in Uncanny X-Men number 101 and then immediately amps up his animosity towards Cyclops, who Wolverine sees as the obstacle between him and Jean. Wolverine takes his anger out on Cyclops by undermining him wherever he can, uh, as we see him doing in this issue by taking over Colossus's train. The resolution of this arc, if we want to call it that, will transpire in the Dark Phoenix saga, with the death of Jean, followed by Cyclops' retirement. Thus, we have a 37-issue conflict being touched on and advanced a little bit here. 
Next, we have a clearly defined romantic storyline in Cyclops' relationship with Colleen Wing. Claremont loved to bring in characters from other books he was writing, and while writing Iron Fist, he cultivated Colleen Wing into a formidable heroine. Imported to X-Men, she becomes a romantic partner for Cyclops, beginning in Uncanny X-Men number 118. In Cry for the Children, this relationship is taken to the next level, with Colleen expressing her feelings to Cyclops directly and offering him a key to her apartment. Cyclops never uses it, however, and the romance storyline will wrap somewhat abruptly in issue 129, with Cyclops telling Jean Grey that he and Colleen are, quote, just friends, nothing more, end quote. Moving away from the romance film, quite literally, we also have a narrative arc describing how Jean Grey moves on with her life without Cyclops. One of the most important elements of Claremont's reconstruction of the Jean Grey character was to give her agency and power outside of her relationship to male X-Men characters. We see this most clearly when she believes that the X-Men are dead, and instead of grieving forever off-page, she moves out of the mansion in issue 117 in order to travel and find herself, a process that will take 10 issues to find resolution, with some notable entanglements with the Phoenix storyline. In our issue, she flirts with the handsome man and ponders her self-identity moving forward with her life. This issue also quite significantly features the most famous narrative arc in X-Men history, the Dark Phoenix Saga. The handsome man in question is, unfortunately, Jason Weingard, aka Mastermind, aka the man whose manipulations triggered the emergence of Dark Phoenix. What we see in 122 is the beginning of those manipulations, an important step that will launch us into the Dark Phoenix set, an arc that will only be resolved in Uncanny number 137, and thus we have a 16-issue arc kicking off here, at least in terms of Mastermind's role. Also at play in this issue, we have the Proteus Saga, a Fight the Monster arc spanning 25 issues, Moira McTaggart's exploration of Phoenix's power and control, a scientific inquiry arc spanning 7 issues, Storm's aforementioned visit to Harlem, a character-building arc spanning just the one issue, Maybe. Professor X in Space, a travel literature arc lasting nine issues. Wolverine's romantic pursuit of Mariko Yoshida, another romance arc spanning 57 issues. Black Tom and the Juggernaut's struggle to murder the X-Men, a cat and mouse arc spanning 22 issues. And Arcade's attempt to murder the X-Men for Black Tom slash the Juggernaut, a shorter yet somehow more elaborate cat and mouse arc spanning just three issues. Now when I say that the arc is spanning X number of issues, this means that the story might not be touched on in every single issue, but it's still in process, still unfolding. A good example of such percolation can be found in the Proteus Saga arc. In Uncanny X-Men number 104, a mutant identified as Mutant X is accidentally released from his cell on Mirror Island during a battle between the X-Men and Magneto. But that's a story for another time, we're told by the narrative caption box. And indeed, the X-Men won't actually even begin to fight Proteus until issue 126 two and a half years later. In the interim, Proteus hangs out in the background, with a murderer in issue 119, and in the vaguely ominous narrative caption that we see in Cry for the Children, which ends, quote, unaware that they're sailing into a nightmare, end quote. When perceived as a whole, when we put these stories together, what we're tracking here is perhaps best described as an impressive bit of juggling. All of these arcs of various nature, size, and complexity pass through Uncanny X-Men 122, each at different points of their progression, some still being set up, some exploring conflict, and some achieving resolution, all in a 17-page comic narrative with a grand total of just 85 panels. Claremont isn't the only one juggling, however. The complexity of his layered narrative demands the reader to keep all these narrative arcs up in the air as well, tracking them, following them, keeping up with the author in order to navigate the simultaneity that Claremont's stories embrace. As they do so, the reader may find themselves drawn in by this complexity, forced to read attentively lest they miss an important detail that will somehow ruin their understanding of a story two years into the future. And in being forced to pay attention, that reader will become immersed. They will become invested in ways that are highly similar to the transition that we're now seeing between casual engagement television and the modern binge-watching phenomenon. As the great Neil Gaiman wrote in response to an article from this very project, It is great to see Chris Claremont getting his dues. Modern TV owes so much to him." It would be wrong to give Claremont's run sole credit for cultivating the structural approach of contemporary long continuity storytelling, but his influence looms large in this field, and taking the time to step back and see what a tangled web he wove is a good way for us as a culture to honor the legacy of a comics auteur. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to learn more about the Claremont Run project, you can find us on the web at www.claremontrun.com and on Twitter at Claremont Run.